Good morning, Botage, Mr. Alexandre Vigigal, Secretary of Geology, Mining and Mineral Transformation from the Ministry of Mines and Energy Brazil. His Excellency, Mr. Timothy Kane, Australian Ambassador Brazil. Uh, Professor Neville Plint, the Director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute, distinguished guests, representatives, welcome to the first in a series of three virtual webinars aimed at encouraging policy dialogue between Brazilian and Australian industry and government stakeholders on the topic of mineral governance and sustainable development. Thank you very much for having made the time to join this webinar today. I'd like to extend our warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Daniel Franks. I'm a professor uh, at the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland, where I lead the Development Minerals Program. Uh, I'll be facilitating this webinar today. Before proceeding, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. Here in Brisbane, uh, this is the Yagara and the Turubu people. On behalf of the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today's webinar is about mining, climate change and the global energy transition, a topic that is of considerable interest to governments, industry and communities globally. Over the course of the next one and a half hours, you'll hear from leading experts who will provide insights into the challenges, the opportunities associated with climate change and the global energy transition and the role of the mining sector in this transition. You'll also have the chance to ask questions uh, of the experts that we have uh, for you today. These webinars have been organised by the Australian Embassy in Brazil and the Brazilian Ministry of Mines and Energy in partnership with the Sustainable Minerals Institute here at the University of Queensland. Now, before I give the floor to our distinguished guests to provide a few opening remarks, please allow me to provide you with a brief overview of the webinar. Uh, following opening remarks, we'll hear from Professor Rick Valenta from the Sustainable Minerals Institute, who will give a presentation on the topic of today's webinar. We'll then have a facilitated panel discussion involving four experts from government and industry in Brazil and Australia. Following the panel discussion, you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions of our experts in the Zoom Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be able to receive your questions. Please state your question concisely and clearly, and we'll try to address as many questions as possible. Uh, please also note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, throughout the course of the webinar, audience microphones and video are disabled to minimise interference. So please put your questions or interventions in that Q&A function. There is interpretation into Portuguese and English available by selecting uh, your preferred language on the bottom right of the screen. I'd now like to hand over to our distinguished guests uh, to say a few opening remarks. We'll start with Alexandre Vigigal, Secretary of Geology, Mining and Mineral Transformation from the Ministry of Mines and Energy, Brazil. Following this, we'll have His Excellency, Mr. Timothy Kane, Australian Ambassador to Brazil. And finally, we'll hear from Professor Plint, Director of the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Uh, thank you, Alexandre. Pois não, Daniel, obrigado. Um bom dia a você. Um bom dia a todos que se encontram na Austrália. Para nós aqui no Brasil, boa tarde. E o meu cumprimento especial ao ilustre embaixador Timothy, que tem sido um parceiro institucional valoroso e inigualável nessa relação tão importante que temos aprofundado do Brasil com a Austrália. Cumprimento também todos os demais que eh, me acompanham nessa mesa virtual desse evento. Eh, em nome, então, do Ministério de Minas e Energia, né, reforço os meus cumprimentos ao embaixador Timothy Kane e gostaria ainda de agradecer a própria embaixada da Austrália aqui no Brasil e ao Sustainable Institute 
da Universidade de Queensland, representado pelo seu diretor, o professor Plint, por esta estreita e valorosa parceria na realização deste webinar. Consideramos imperiosa a discussão sobre a mineração no contexto das mudanças climáticas e da transição energética mundial. Especialmente quando pensamos na mineração do futuro, que deverá compatibilizar a geração de riquezas e o crescimento econômico almejados com as novas demandas socioambientais, com foco nas gerações presentes e futuras. Esse é o tema que hoje nos reúne aqui. Como formuladores de políticas públicas e com as elevadas responsabilidades que temos, acreditamos que a promoção do diálogo entre os diversos atores dessa importante indústria, bem como a troca de experiência entre países com grande potencial e vocação para mineração, como o são o Brasil e a Austrália. Só um minuto, e a Austrália. Essa é a razão pela qual nos colocamos aqui, de forma inequívoca, para avançarmos no desenvolvimento sustentável e na governança desse setor importante que é a mineração, contribuindo assim para o alcance da posição pretendida para a atividade em nível global. Não posso deixar de mencionar o grande potencial que o Brasil e a Austrália têm em recursos minerais, decorrente de nossas amplas extensões territoriais, diversidade geológica e mão de obra qualificada. Diante desse cenário, é que a atual gestão do Ministério de Minas e Energia concedeu especial atenção a uma indústria de inegável importância para o desenvolvimento social e econômico, não apenas do nosso país, mas também do mundo. Importância essa que pode ser tida como crescente no contexto do aumento da demanda por minerais críticos e estratégicos que se atrela à tão atual transição energética mundial. Ao mesmo tempo em que é inequívoca a força da nossa mineração, não podemos deixar de reconhecer que o modelo de desenvolvimento econômico atual deve ser aprimorado para que se coadune com os princípios da sociedade contemporânea e isso requer de nós, autores do setor mineral, atores do setor mineral, atuarmos como catalisadores desse importante processo de transição global para uma economia de baixo impacto. O Brasil ocupa posição chave nesse cenário, como um dos países que mais dispõe de fontes energéticas renováveis, sendo nossa matriz energética e elétrica um destaque em cenário global. O ilustre embaixador Tim, em nossa conversa aqui antes de iniciarmos, até mencionava a oportunidade singular que teve de conhecer uma das maiores obras de engenharia do mundo na indústria de produção de energia, que é a usina a hidrelétrica de Foz do Iguaçu. Com essa fonte limpa, possuímos grande capacidade de entregar ao mundo produtos como baterias para a eletromobilidade com elevado grau de uso de energia limpa em toda a cadeia produtiva, em praticamente todas as fases do processamento industrial. Nessa linha, os instrumentos de planejamento estratégicos estão estreitamente alinhados ao cenário que aqui estou expondo. Em 2020, lançamos o Programa Mineração e Desenvolvimento, de 2020 a 2023, um instrumento de metas e ações para o setor mineral brasileiro e que conta com um plano específico de compromisso socioambiental na mineração. 
os projetos Crescer com Responsabilidade e Mineração do Presente para o Futuro, com foco na sustentabilidade, em novas tecnologias e de baixo impacto e de minerais estratégicos. Recentemente, em dezembro de 2020, após 13 anos desde a edição anterior, foi aprovado também o Plano Nacional de Energia 2050, após inúmeros debates com o setor público, setor privado e a sociedade. O plano é pautado pelas oportunidades e desafios da transição energética para uma economia de baixo carbono e buscando segurança energética para sustentar o crescimento consistente da economia nacional, atrelado à demanda por eletricidade. Não há dúvidas dos desafios desse processo de transição, mas estamos certos dos avanços em curso e dos benefícios que advirão de parcerias como essas que aqui se concretizam nessa importante presença e interação entre o Brasil e a Austrália. Aproveito esta distinguida oportunidade para reafirmar que somente haverá, haverá a transição energética, a tão desejada transição energética para a redução das emissões de carbono com o desenvolvimento da mineração. Com os bens minerais é que teremos a oportunidade de produzir bens, equipamentos, aparelhos, máquinas, instrumentos e dispositivos de alta tecnologia para atender às demandas atuais da profunda transformação que a sociedade precisa. Por isso, desejo nessa manhã e nessa tarde votos de pleno sucesso no presente evento, certo de quão profícuas serão as discussões que este webinar proporcionará a todos nós. Muito obrigado, com meu especial abraço ao embaixador Timothy. Um, thank you, Secretary Vidigal. Um, please, I now welcome to the floor Ambassador Kane. Thank you, Daniel. Good evening, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us today. É um prazer participar deste webinar e quero dar minhas boas vindas a todos. Secretário Vitigal, como sempre, é um prazer ter mais uma oportunidade de trabalhar com você e seu time no Ministério de Minas e Energia. Nossa colaboração nesta série de webinars se soma à nossa já forte parceria. Nós queremos ser parte do sucesso no setor de mineração brasileiro. Professor Plint, thank you and the Sustainable Minerals Institute. SMI is a leader in minerals education and research in Australia and globally. And we welcome the opportunity to work with you in delivering this webinar series. Thank you as well to our presenters and panelists, Professor Rick Valenta, Dr. Helen Dejeling, Senor Frederico Bedran Oliveira, and Senor Gustavo de Davici de Almeida Bastos. We value your time and your insights. A Austrália e o Brasil têm fortes laços no setor de mineração. Em resposta à agenda de reforma liderada pelo, pelo secretário Vitigal, temos visto um aumento do investimento, investimento australiano no setor de mineração brasileiro nos últimos anos. Esses webinars e é mais um passo adiante para avançar nossa colaboração em mineração. Atualmente, temos dois desafios globais, que são, é claro, a pandemia e as mudanças climáticas. Durante a pandemia, 
Os setores de mineração na Austrália e no Brasil têm demonstrado enorme resiliência, apontando a qual importante é a mineração para a recuperação econômica pós-pandemia. A mineração também desempenha um papel vital no enfrentamento às mudanças climáticas. O setor de mineração australiano, como, com o apoio de políticas dos governos federal e estaduais, estão liderando essa tarefa de várias formas. As empresas australianas estão fornecendo minérios críticos para o desenvolvimento e adoção de tecnologias de baixas emissões. No Brasil, a empresa australiana Jevoa Mining está pronta para desempenhar um papel no fornecimento regional de cobalto e níquel. E as empresas australianas como Oz Minerals e Agia Resources estão na dianteira para avançar a produção de cobre no Brasil. O governo da Austrália empenhou 14 bilhões de dólares americanos até 2030 para desenvolver tecnologias de baixas emissões e estabeleceu uma estratégia de minerais críticos para assegurar o fornecimento dos minerais necessários a essas tecnologias. As empresas australianas também estão liderando os esforços para descarbonizar suas operações minerárias, com companhias como BHP, Rio Tinto, South 32 e Fortescue Metals Group, comprometendo-se a cerrar suas emissões líquidas. Nossas empresas também estão mudando suas suas, suas estratégias de investimento, dando ênfase a tecnologias como o hidrogênio, com prováveis investimentos em hidrogênio verde no Brasil. So I very much look forward to this event at an important juncture for global mining. I again thank Secretary Vigigal and his team, SMI, and company representatives for the opportunity to work with you on this series. I wish you every success for this event and for the important work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I now welcome to the floor, Professor Neville Plint from the University of Queensland Sustainable Minerals Institute. I too acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to their ancestors and their dependents. I would like to thank His Excellency, Ambassador Timothy Kane, uh, Secretary Vigigal, for the opening remarks this morning. Um, it is an honour to have you join us for this webinar. And I'd also like to welcome our distinguished panel members from both Australia and Brazil. And a, wel a warm welcome to to everyone that has connected for the webinar today. I thought I might start just by giving a brief overview of the SMR for those that don't know us well. Um, we, we're made up of six research centers, uh, a center of excellence in Chile and a technology transfer company, JK Tech. Um, we have a proud, uh, we are proud of our track record across the resources sector. And Ambassador Kane, thank you very much for your kind remarks. We are very proud of what we've been able to achieve over the last 50 years in areas of exploration, of mining, of mineral processing, workplace health, safety, and well-being, as well as mine rehabilitation, water management, energy, social responsibility, and governance. Um, our work is characterized by being transdisciplinary, and, and it's what makes us unique is how we bring these multiple disciplines together. Um, to, to do independent, impartial and rigorous work to, to address the challenges facing the sector. Um, and recently, over the last couple of years, we focused on a number of 
strategic programs that we believe are the key issues facing the industry. And we'll hear from some of those today. Um, Rick Valenta's uh, not only the director of a number of our centers, but also is running our complex all bodies program, which really looks to where will we get the future metals we need to transition to a low carbon, um, low carbon economy, low carbon future, and do that in a responsible way. Um, you've met Daniel, who very kindly, and I'd like to thank Daniel and his team for putting together the webinar today, um, and really look forward to the discussions. And, and Daniel's leading our development minerals work, which is a whole new area, which SMI is now moving into under Daniel's leadership. Um, and then we have another program, which is very pertinent to today's discussions, looking at governance and leadership and having a look at how we can put good governance structures in place and the role in leadership in implementing those policies and procedures. So a couple of comments about the webinar. Um, today's webinar is the first in a series of three webinars. And really the, the aim of the webinars is to encourage dialogue between Brazil and Australia, um, between industry and government stakeholders and civil society, and to really focus in on the topic of mineral governance and sustainable development. Um, it's really interesting to have a look at the opportunity that Australia and Brazil have as being leaders in the global mining industry to actually shape the future of sustainable development, um, both at home and abroad. And that, that really involves shaping policy, um, shaping and encouraging dialogue around increasingly important issues as I said, around supply, around tailings management, bioremediation, um, sustainable community development, um, and then responding to the need for, for a mineral intensive future. Um, and one really driven by the global need for us to make this energy transition, but to do it in a responsible way. So as one of the world leading research institutes in the resources space, um, we really want to be at the forefront of responding to these challenges. And we are committed, every member of my team is committed to delivering innovative, knowledge-based solutions for the industry and the sharing of ideas and research. Um, and the webinars are one way that we do that. So we have had a long history of supporting the industry and supporting governments around the world to navigate the sustainability challenges um, and a couple of examples of that would be the International Mining for Development Centre, which we did in collaboration with the University of Western Australia. And I think it's really important that we, we highlight the, the ability and the need for organisations like ourselves to collaborate widely with universities around the world. And that's part of the sharing and making sure that we can, we can address these challenges. So today's webinar is very timely um, and it um, really focuses on the interest of a topic of great interest globally and to ourselves, and it really looks at the role of mining in responding to climate change and the global energy transition. Um, as I've said a couple of times, the, the adoption of these new energy systems across the globe is set to drive a massive increase in demand for a number of specific minerals. The extraction of these minerals will present significant challenges in terms of environmental footprint and in terms of global sustainability. Um, I'm sure, and I'm really looking forward to the presentations by Professor Rick Valenta, and really looking forward to the panel discussions with, um, with our colleagues from both Australia and Brazil, and from industry and government and academia. So thank you very much, and thank you very much to everybody for, for the time and commitment to the dialogue, um, and look forward to the, the rest of the morning. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Plint, and uh, uh, also Ambassador and Secretary for your uh, welcome remarks. I'm now going to turn to our first speaker. We have a large audience uh, with us this morning and this evening. Uh, so we'd like to get now into the content of the, the conversation. Our first speaker is Professor Rick Valenta. Uh, he's the director of the WH Bryan Mining and Geology Research Centre, the program lead of the Complex Ore Bodies Program and the acting director of the Julius Krushnit Mineral Research Centre here also at Sustainable Minerals Institute. Uh, Rick's work uh, focuses on improving discovery, mining and processing um, of ore deposits. He's trained as a geologist, he's held academic positions, um, but has uh, more than two decades of 
uh, industry experience in roles like chief geologist, chief operating officer, and CEO of a number of uh, minerals companies. Um, he has worked on a significant number of mineral discoveries across a whole range of deposits. Um, welcome, Professor Rick Valenta, I'll hand over now to you. All right, can you hear me? Good. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like also to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respect to their ancestors and their descendants. Um, Mr. Alexander de Vidigao, uh, Secretary of Geology, Mining and Mineral Transformation, Ministry of Mines and Energy, Brazil. Um, Your Excellency, Mr. Timothy Kane, Australian Ambassador to Brazil, fellow panelists and speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Muito obrigado pela oportunidade de apresentar hoje. I'm talking today really on the, the, the topic that has already been brought up, which is mining, climate change, and the global energy transition. I have, uh, it's, a, it's a huge topic, and uh, I have 20 minutes, so we better get straight into it if I can get the slides to advance. There we go. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I'm presenting a small taste of the work that we are carrying out in this area. And these pictures represent most of the people that we've been working with, work being carried out at the Sustainable Minerals Institute, at the rest of UQ, and also with our large number of industry and research partners. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is uh, divide the themes by a number of quotes and I'm not attributing this quote, uh, but at the end, I'll tell you where these quotes come from. And the first of these is our resources, uh, it basically says our resources are not limited. We're not going to run out of the resources we need to accomplish the energy transition. Uh, what limits them is our capacity to extract them at a, at a reasonable cost. As an example of that, and I know that copper is a traditional element, but it's also a very key element in the global energy transition. Uh, this is just a graph showing the growth of copper endowment since um, 1900 and copper production. Um, and those numbers on the right hand side are significant. 725 million tons is the amount of copper that we have consumed since the beginning of time and 3,500 million tons, 3.5 billion tons of copper metal is the amount of copper that we know about right now. Um, 1 billion tons of that is in undeveloped deposits and 1.7 billion tons of that is in developing mines. So we have continued to, to develop new, new copper resources and uh, copper for copper and many other um, elements our challenge is not running out of copper. Our challenge is being able to sustainably produce that copper and the other elements that we're talking about today. So now I want to talk about what we're good at. Well, one thing that we've been good at as an industry for a very long time um, is reduction of costs. And this is a graph, again, from Richard Shawty of Minex Consulting showing the decrease in cost per ton of ore from 1900 to 2010 in this case, and some of the innovations that have led to that, that decrease. So we've, we've been able through our technological advances to make enormous progress in economic production of, of ore. Um, but the question is, can continued cost reduction unlock the metal supply we're going to need for the energy transition. Um, now I want to talk about another thing we've been really good at. And this graph basically shows the exponential growth of, of froth flotation cells. Froth flotation is at the center of a lot of the mineral production that we do. And, and those little boxes there from 1916 are the flotation cells that we used to extract copper from, uh, or to extract base metals. From, from their ores after they've been ground up. Um, and there's one from 1973. It's a little bit bigger from the Bougainville mine. And now if we shoot ahead to now, that enormous vat, you can see the people for scale, is what a flotation cell looks like in 2020. So it's an exponential growth like so many of the things that we're seeing. 
And the question that arises out of that is, can we just keep making everything bigger and bigger um, forever? Um, and, and here's another outgrowth of that. And, that. and what I'm showing here is the projected growth of copper production um, going out to 2050. So our copper production now is somewhere around 20 million tons per year. By the time we get out to 2050 out here, our copper production is projected, you know, there are varying project projections, but this particular projection, which is a, a towards resilience scenario from a publication says we'll get out to about 45 million tons of copper metal. And this yellow line here, the orange line, shows the decrease in grade from just below 3% out here to well below 0.5% out here. And when we look at the implication of that, this is production of tailings which is of course very topical. So here's the production of tailings out to the year 2000. And then each one of these stripes out here represents the equivalent to that production. By the time we hit 2050, which is when all the targets are for um, decarbonization, for net zero, we'll have produced in this century nine times as much tailings as we produced in the 20th century just in this 50 years. And that's just saying that. And the question is that arises from this and some of the other things I've said is, are we reaching the end of this approach, the end of economies of scale? I'm gonna switch now to climate change. Um, and this is another quote from the same source. And I'll tell you what the source is later, but it basically says all fuels produce carbon dioxide and that if we produce too much, carbon dioxide, it could accumulate in the atmosphere and have deleterious effects. And we're living um, that phenomenon. Um, this is a photo from the Australian bushfires of, of last year. I was evacuated as part of those bushfires. And, and the quote is from a former commissioner of the Fire and Rescue Service of New South Wales, where a lot of the, um, where a lot of the fires happened. And what he's basically saying is that this is not part of a normal cycle, that these fires are anomalous. And the only other thing I'm going to say about climate change, because it's well studied and well presented, um, and I think most um, reasonable people who believe in science um, accept the arguments for its existence. Um, th th this is a graph that shows um, the, the do nothing scenario out to 2050. Um, and those red areas represent areas that will be classified as uninhabitable in 2050 if we do nothing. So, so it's arguments like these that are driving the world to finally take action to address climate change. And what we've seen, and this is a very recent um, uh, um, assessment, uh, this is from the International Energy Agency, looking at the projection of, of future sources of energy supply. And what we can see here is that oil and coal, you know, we're at, we're at 2020, and, and hopefully what we'll do is look back at 2020 as the turning point, because that's the way it's, it's portrayed on this projection, that we will have turned everything around in 2020 and have finally moved towards um, replacement of most of our oil and coal um, and natural gas with much more renewable sources. And I guess an encouraging point that suggests that that could happen is the fact um, what this graph is showing um, is that um, you know there are nearly 80% of the emissions um, you know of current. Um, global CO2 emissions are have expressed some form of commitment to to achievement of net zero by 2050, which will allow us to achieve that goal. But what we want to talk about today is the mining industry and its response. And this is the mining industry's response. So reduction of scope one and two um, emissions, which are what um, companies are directly responsible for and their suppliers, I guess, um, almost every major company, and I know that you could add other companies to this list. It's a little bit Australian focused, but Vale is certainly there and we'll hear more about Vale later. Um, you, can, you can see that there are, that, that every company has a 2030 or thereabouts um, 
target for reduction in scope one and two emissions. NZE is net zero emissions. Almost every company has a 2050 net zero emissions target, except for Anglo-American, which is 2040, and Fortescue Minerals, which is 2030. These emission targets are getting more aggressive as time goes on. Uh, the major companies have bought into this. The next column talks about remuneration. Every company has linked remuneration to achievement of these goals. Um, in other words, the, the, um, the salaries of their senior management are tied to, a, to some extent to the achievement of, of um, these sustainability goals, which is obviously a demonstration of their importance. Um, scope three emissions, uh, the emissions from their products, um, the, 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 uh, the table is not quite as full, but a lot of the major companies have undertaken um, to, to make great reductions in scope three emissions, which are much more challenging to achieve. And again, these targets are expected to increase. And we know anecdotally that a lot of companies are, are redoubling their effort in these areas. The next column basically talks about um, industry bodies. And this is basically saying that a lot of the companies out there um, are saying that if they belong to an industry body that that comes out against achievement of these sustainability goals, they will depart from that industry body. Um, and the final one is carbon prices. A, a lot of those are scenario dependent, but uh, Vale has published um, one that they will use for all their planning. Um, I hope that's I hope that's correct. It was I, I got that from the web. So in order to achieve all that, what we're seeing is that, and, the, and the, the names here don't matter, but but what we're seeing is that for almost every commodity you would care to mention, we are going to see uh, large and exponential growth in demand going out to 2050. And as I said before, in almost every case, um, leaving some geopolitical considerations aside, we know about the supply that we need to achieve this. So... Um, so now what I want to do is just consider a little bit the barriers to achieving that mineral supply that will allow us to, to make that transition. Um, and I want to put two more quotes in here from the same source, one of which is saying that, that uh, an important consideration in achieving this mineral supply is that it is public resistance to achievement of that mineral supply. That the public, the stake, the, the people in the area of, of uh, mines um, will not accept um, the mineral supply being achieved in their backyard. And that also um, achieving that mineral supply can't be treated apart from the environmental effects of that mineral supply, which is quite obvious. But it's led us to this program that's been mentioned already, the Complex Ore Bodies Program, which is basically saying future mineral supply is going to come from continued production and growth in new ore bodies, new discoveries, and from recycling. And we know already that discovery rates are, are decreasing um, and that recycling is not actually keeping up with growth in demand and isn't expected to until our po population starts to, you know, stops its continued increase. And so we're going to achieve that, have to achieve that from known ore bodies and complex ore bodies. And what we're saying is our complex ore bodies are ore bodies that face technical, political, social, environmental, regulatory complexities that are not allowing them to be put into production. So complex geology, complex social situations, and of course, um, environmental barriers and challenges and their terrible effects um, that we're all familiar with. So again, um, this is, we, we've worked on a number of these and I'll talk, talk about it, but the, this is undeveloped copper ore bodies. So about a billion tons of copper metal, um, most of which has been known about for decades that can't be put into production, um, distributed around the world. Um, so there's a large resource of undeveloped ore bodies that can't be put into production because of challenges um, that are not technical in nature. They're environmental, social, and regulatory. And the, previously, people have made arguments that, well, all we need to have happen is the copper price to go up or the cost of production to go down, and we'll achieve all that production without any problem. 
And we did a global analysis of copper mineralization or copper undeveloped copper ore bodies. And what we found was that about 3% of them would be able to be put into production simply through an increase in copper price. Um, and that a further 200 million tons of copper metal, you could say was indirectly price insensitive. So in other words, if you were able to um, spend a lot of money on, on lower footprint alternatives around water tailings and infrastructure, you might be able to put it into production. And then there was another 75% that was price insensitive. Doesn't matter what the copper price does, doesn't matter what clever technological solutions you come up with, the solutions that you need to come up with are relating to the fundamental ways that companies operate and interact with their stakeholders. Here's an example of the way we map that. So what we're looking at here is a, is a global map of water risk. Um, and then we're just looking at tons of copper and grade here um, in, a, in a cascading diagram from zero to a billion tons. And the colors, the, the more red they are, the higher risk, the more yellow they are, the lower risk. And we're just looking at that array of undeveloped ore bodies. And we put that together into, um, it, into a whole series of measures of sustainability risks that cover water, waste, conservation, land uses, communities, social vulnerability, governance, a whole range of different factors that allow us to try to predict and address the challenges that face future mineral production. And this work has been led by Eleanor Leb, who's, uh, who ha and, and this is a diagram from one of the publications she led, looking at the, and what we're looking at specifically at here, and the reason I'm coming to this, is that we're looking at the, um, um, the, the energy transition minerals that we're going to need. And what this matrix shows is the various different categories of challenge for those minerals, um, then rolled up into governance, environment, and social, where again, the, the red colors um, indicate very high risk, the blue colors indicate lower risk, um, and so each of these commodities faces a varying matrix of risks. And then over here on the right, what we're looking at is the growth in those commodities required relative to now in order to achieve the, the energy transition that we're all talking about. So there are some commodities like nickel, um, cobalt, lithium, rare earths that are going to have to grow a significant amount. Um, and there are also commodities that uh, whose growth is required a little bit less, but as hydrogen becomes more and more important in the case of platinum, that's also going to have to grow. And, and this diagram on the far right shows the amount of additional ore tonnage that's going to come from that. And I guess what that shows, which, which makes you think again of environmental challenges, what that shows is that copper and iron are probably going to have the greatest effect in that respect. But what our research has also shown is that some of these other commodities like rare earths, um, for example, and, and, um, and, and some others as well, even though volumetrically they won't produce a whole, uh, you know, a huge amount of tailings, that their footprints will be occurring in areas of much higher biodiversity and environmental sensitivity and so will create their own challenges. So what I want to do is just run quickly now through a few of the things that we've got to build in order to achieve this energy transition. I'll start with fuel cells, because that corresponds to platinum, which is at the top of the matrix of risks that we face. So in order to build these fuel cells, we're going to have to achieve platinum supply, which will be easy. But the other thing that we're going to have to achieve is to address the risks associated with that supply, the high water conservation community land use and so on social vulnerability. If we go on to the next one, um, in this case, you know, we're looking at electric motors that will go into battery electric vehicles and look at the, look at the array of, of risks we're gonna be facing for, uh, for, uh, for the future supply, for achieving the future supply of those materials. Same thing goes for, um, for lithium ion batteries or, or really the other battery alternatives that are, that are out there. Um, and there are some surprises like the, the, the general overall risk associated with lithium aside from water is, uh, is relatively low. Um, and wind, uh, you know, wind generation, again, you can look at that, that, um, that array of, of risks and, and predict 
the the risks that we're going to or that we're the challenges we're going to have to address in order to achieve that future supply. So now I want to come back to these quotes I showed, um, and I'm getting to the end of my presentation. So here are the here are the quotes that I went through, um, talking about the limitation of our resources, um, public challenges, climate change, how important it's going to become. And this all comes from a paper written in 1968. I was seven years old when this paper was written by uh, Walter Hibbert, who was the, um, the, at the time he was the head of the, um, of the US Bureau of Mines. Um, he also said, we need to develop the technology to deal with mine waste and that's something that we're focusing on. Um, but also interestingly, he said, my prediction is we're not gonna um, deal with this until it's probably almost too late. And that's where we are now. So one thing that tells me is that we've known about this for a long time. The other thing it tells me is that just writing papers and saying, well, yes, but I wrote a paper about it, um, isn't going to work. And so that's why we're focused on, we do write papers, but we're focused on a lot more than writing papers. Um, what I'm showing here is uh, my view of the of the future landscape for this area. So, so um, where from where we stand, our journey uh, is going to have to get us to a whole series of objectives in order to achieve this globally global energy transition in terms of safety, zero harm, a change in the way we operate so that we achieve societal expect, uh, acceptance, um, improvement in the way that we make discoveries in the areas that are going to make the future emphasis of, of mineral exploration. Um, certification of the minerals we produce, um, mining in ways that reduce our footprint on the on the landscape, um, from water to um, carbon to tailings and contamination. Um, and so our approach is to do research in this area, but most importantly, to work with our industry to carry out industry collaborative research and training that addresses these important challenges where we measure our impact by uptake of the solutions we arrive at by our industry partners in a way that actually makes a difference to the problem. And of course, the other way we see having impact is by training the next generation of leaders who are going to take us to the achievement of these goals in 2050. So. Thanks very much. That's my presentation. You're muted. Thank you, Rick, for an excellent presentation. There's a lot there for us to dive into for our panel discussion uh, that is now set to follow. Um, before I move uh, into um, that discussion. Let me first um, introduce our, our panelists. Um, in addition to uh, Professor Valenta, who will stay on um, during this panel discussion, uh, we have uh, Dr. Helen uh, Degling. Uh, Helen is the Director of the Minerals Geoscience uh, for, uh, sorry, Director of Minerals Geoscience for the Geological Survey of Queensland. Uh, which is uh, the state uh, of which um, we're broadcasting from here in Australia at the moment. She has a diverse background, uh, including working in, in the academy um, at the Australian National University and University of Calgary um, on aspects of geochemistry, geochronology, thermodynamic, thermodynamics of metamorphic terrains. Um, but she's also had uh, experience uh, in the gold and base metal sector in Australia and, and South America. Um, she's worked in uh, various uh, different geological settings. Um, she joined the Geological Survey of Queensland in 2018. Uh, our next uh, panellist is uh, Dr. Federico uh, Bedrin um, Oliveira. Uh, Federico is a geologist and lawyer with a master's degree in economic geology uh, and mineral exploration. Uh, he's a public servant uh, with a career in infrastructure analysis. He's currently the Director of Geology and Mineral Production at the Secretariat of Geology, Mining and Mineral Transformation in Brazil's Ministry of Mines and Energy. 
Uh, welcome, Frederico. And finally, our last panelist is uh, Mr. Gustavo um, Bastos. Uh, Gustavo is Executive Manager of the Centre of Excellence Technology and Innovation for Iron Ore at uh, Vali, and he's responsible for the Power Shift program. He's a civil engineer by training. He's got an MBA in business management. Uh, he's uh, also specialized in railway engine engineering. He's undertaken um, uh, leadership uh, courses at MIT uh, and University of Pretoria. Um, he's got more than 15, experience, 15 years of experience in various roles uh, in the mineral sector. Uh, so welcome to our panelists. I'm, I'm first gonna start, I think, um, with Frederico, and please for the audience, um, continue the questions in the Q&A function and uh, we'll weave them into this panel discussion. Um, Frederico, from the perspective of the Ministry of Mines and Energy, what role do you see for Brazil in supplying minerals for the energy transition, uh, both domestically for, for Brazil, but also for, for the, the rest of the, the world? And, and what's the Brazilian government doing uh, in this transition? Boa noite. Obrigado, Daniel. É, após essa brilhante palestra aí do, do Rick, eu acho que a gente tem alguns pontos aí para discutir né, e avançar. Bom, é, eu agradeço a oportunidade de estar aqui com vocês e essa parceria com o Instituto e com a Embaixada, né, discutir um tema que não poderia ser mais relevante como a transição energética, né? Eu acho que nós começamos muito bem essa, essa nossa tríade, esses nossos três seminários, com um tema é, bastante relevante atual. Eu acho que as nações estão se comprometendo, as empresas também estão se comprometendo, assim como o Rick falou, e, e a transição energética ela é uma resposta para esses compromissos. É, o Rick colocou muito bem a questão de, de crescimento mundial da geração de energias renováveis, e quanto isso, que, quanto isso vai demandar em termos de, de, de minerais. E alguns estudos estão mostrando isso, por exemplo, do Banco Mundial, da, da Agência Internacional de Energia, está mostrando isso, e ao mesmo tempo mostrando que a América Latina e o Brasil têm um papel fundamental para o suprimento desses minerais. Assim, nós, assim como a Austrália, seremos cruciais para o suprimento dessas cadeias de energias renováveis, baterias e carros elétricos, né? Que, que se avizinha. Então, essa mudança em curso né, tem um enorme potencial para mudar a escala e a composição da de demanda global para minerais e metais. Por isso, é importante cenários como esse, a gente trocar a experiência né, e a gente é, discutir como, como se colocar para esses novos cenários. O, os recursos minerais utilizados não são os mesmos, é, tratará uma necessidade de a gente diversificar a nossa matriz mineral, e é isso que nós viemos fazendo, é isso que o governo brasileiro vem tentando fazer. Né? O Brasil hoje tem um relevante potencial mineral. É, em termos de produção atual, nós, é, nós somos conhecidos de players mundiais em vários, mas a nossa produção, poderíamos dar, destacar aqui o nióbio, o tântalo, o grafite, o manganês, níquel, cobre, titânio, entre outros, vanádio, alumínio e por aí vai. E também temos potencial exploratório e projetos já em desenvolvimento como, por exemplo, as terras aras, o lítio e o cobalto, entre outros. Então, somado a isso tudo, cresce a importância dos minerais nesse sistema de descarbonização. Existe de nós, formuladores de políticas públicas, que a gente interaja com outros setores, como o setor de energia. Isso coloca nós aqui, como representantes do Ministério de Minas e Energia, uma oportunidade única para que a gente possa interagir com esses dois segmentos, esses dois setores, e avançar nesse tema que é chamado a transição energética. De um lado, que o aumento da demanda mundial por fontes renováveis de energia demanda um, um, uma maior quantidade de minerais, a própria indústria da mineração também consome grande quantidade, grande quantidade de energia e está migrando sua matriz para, para consumo de energia de fontes renováveis e avançando em, em, também em eficiência energética, assim como o Gustavo eh, vai apresentar para vocês. Então, bons exemplos foram dados pelo Rick, Vale, eh, Anglo, América, entre outros, já estão avançando nesses temas. E como é que o Brasil, como é que nós, do Ministério, temos, temos atuado nesse sentido? Eh, em 2010, lá no nosso Plano Nacional de Mineração, 2030, nós elencamos vários minerais que nós colocávamos como estratégicos. 
Agora, em 2020, nós renovamos essa lista para que a gente possa atuar nessas cadeias prioritárias. E quais, quais são as nossas políticas? O que é que nós estamos fazendo? Estamos desenvolvendo parcerias na linha de tecnologia, principalmente com o Ministério de Ciência e Tecnologia do Brasil. Estamos promovendo discussões como essa, como essa oportunidade, que é esse, esse, esse cenário com um importante instituto como o SMI. É, recentemente, publicamos um decreto para que o governo acompanhe projetos específicos de minerais estratégicos, para que a gente acelere, de maior celeridade, esses projetos. E estamos, recentemente, trabalhando em umas conversas preliminares com o nosso Banco Nacional de Desenvolvimento, para que possa ter linhas de financiamento específicas para esses minerais críticos. Do ponto de vista do nosso serviço geológico, nós estamos avançando em mapeamento de minera desses minerais estratégicos com programas temáticos específicos, por exemplo, para, por exemplo, para lítio, grafita, cobalto, cobre, terras aras, esses já em andamento ou já finalizados. Estamos intensificando o nosso mapeamento geológico das principais províncias minerais brasileiras com foco nesses elementos. Em uma outra linha, estamos realizando leilões, leilões de ativos desse, do nosso serviço geológico brasileiro. Por exemplo, amanhã mesmo teremos um leilão é, de, um, de, um, de um depósito de cobre e ouro em Bom Jardim de Goiás. Já do, do lado da nossa agência, nossa mineração, também estamos atuando na linha de oferta de área de pesquisa, desburocratização de processos, simplificação de um aproveitamento de minerais associados, né, que antes eram vistos aí como subprodutos e hoje já estão vindos como, um, como, como coprodutos. E acreditamos que, após a devida estruturação da, da NM, será possível um olhar específico para esses, esses bens minerais. Né? Então, assim, o Brasil, assim como muito bem colocou o secretário, está muito bem posicionado no setor energético. Nós temos aí 48% do total da nossa energia consumida é de fonte renovável. Com isso, temos grandes oportunidades para que o setor mineral é, possa produzir esses minerais estratégicos baseado em, em fontes renováveis, tendo uma linha totalmente, é, uma busca de uma linha de produção verde. É, temos possibilidade também de avançar em produtos com valor agregado, não apenas óxidos e concentrados. Para alcançar esses objetivos, precisamos disso, precisamos de diálogo, precisamos de esforço público e com participação pública e privada. Por fim, é, é, Daniel, o futuro ele, ele é verde e sustentável, e ele necessariamente passa pelos setores de energia e mineração. Yeah, thank you for those um, remarks, Frederico. I think that um, uh, it's very clear that this is a, an area that has, presents huge challenges, but also major opportunities for countries like Australia and, and Brazil. And uh, and the public sector has been very active in, in pursuing those. Um, I'm seeing in the chat line, uh, lots of audience members showing lots of love for your presentation. Rick uh, coming in, so, um, lots of uh, comments of uh, support. Also, we're getting quite a few questions in the Q and A function that Rick is um, answering in the in the chat box in the, and answering by text. I just want to reiterate that if you want to put your questions in Portuguese, uh, please do so. Um, we we will um, do our best uh, to um, interpret those and, um, and and answer them as we go along. So please uh, please do that as well. I'm now going to turn to uh, to Helen um, from the Helen Degling from the Geological Survey of Queensland. Um, so we've had the perspective of a, a Brazilian regulatory agency, um, and now let's hear from an Australian regulatory agency. Um, Helen, what's You've been doing a lot of work in this area, just like Frederico. Um, what's your view on the importance of minerals in that global energy transition? Uh, what issues kind of stand out as really important um, or challenging? Um, there's a big question around ESG as well. What are the factors in, in ESG investment that are influencing the behaviour of, of the sector? And, and, and what's Queensland as a government uh, doing about this topic? Ellen. Wow, thanks, Daniel. Um, and good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, that's a pretty broad ranging question, so I'll do my best to, to cover it all. Um, and I guess I'll start with the more of the problem statement, you know, where, where 
we in Queensland or I myself um, see the roadblocks and the, and the difficulties in making that energy transition. Um, I think they, they fall under a number of categories. We can have the, the technical or the operational um, roadblocks such as you know, processing rare earths, for example, are notoriously difficult to extract from the rocks. Um, uh, cobalt, where it exists with copper, can be very refractory, bound up with, with pyrite. So those are very, very technical, you know, technical problems that research, um, research and development activities can, can address. Um, there are also the, the community roadblocks, you know, as, as Rick alluded to in his presentation, there is a demand from society around the globe, from community, from, from individuals, from large companies to small, that we, we make this en energy transition um, and it is necessary, as Rick said. However, there is also that corresponding um, hesitation or resistance to mining overall. So a general lack of understanding of the role, and I guess that's why we're here today, of the role that mining does play and the important role that mining plays in the energy transition. So uh, addressing those community concerns and, um, and ensuring that we remake the, the image of the mining industry to be more um, involved and more essential to that energy transition is an important um, thing. And then there are the political or geopolitical roadblocks such as, for example, the dominance rather than diversification of supply for certain commodities around the world. And, you know, that can, when, when political tensions arise, that can lead to disruptions in supply chains. It can lead to trade wars and all of that sort of thing. So as, as Rick said, a lot of the deposits around the world that might be developed are um, only a very, very small proportion of them are related to the price of that commodity. There are a lot of other factors that lead to, to a lack of production in those areas. So each of these issues, whether it's technical, operational, whether it's um, community or society related or political, they all require a different response. Um, and I think that the work that the Sustainable Minerals Institute, just to give them a plug, um, is excellent because it is trying to address issues across all of those, those different realms. Um, within Queensland, we obviously have a more local focus in terms of our domestic um, industry. However, um, also a global focus given that uh, Australia and Queensland supply uh, materials and, and metals to the to the rest of the world, um, similar to to Brazil and many other countries, of course. Um, so our response initially has been um, in 2019. There was an agreement that was signed between the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison and the US President around the supply of critical minerals. And in Queensland, the response to that was the development of a new economy minerals initiative and in Queensland we refer to critical minerals as new economy minerals to reflect that change, um, the energy transition, the change in focus away from uh, coal, a coal-based energy sources and a coal-based economy or a, low car a high carbon economy to a low carbon economy. Um, the new economy minerals initiative is multi-dimensional. It, um, it includes a large research component, much of which is with um, Rick Valenta and his team at the Sustainable Minerals Institute. Um, and as part of that, we're investigating how to make best use of the metal value that remains in mine, mine waste, mine tailings, which is a big program that Rick alluded to as well. Um, we're looking at sustainable methods for rare earth extraction, for example, using bioleaching and phyto mining, which is the use of hyperaccumulator plants, and then various other aspects of, you know, new deposits, um, understanding existing deposits and where, where the critical minerals may lie. But one thing that it is important to understand about critical minerals is that the majority of them occur as secondary minerals. 
to a, a primary commodity. So, for example, cobalt is a secondary mineral in a lot of copper deposits or nickel deposits. Um, rare earths are a secondary phase within iron oxide copper gold deposits um, or phosphorites. So there are a lot of mines that exist or a lot of deposits that exist where they're being mined for a primary commodity such as copper, such as gold, um, whereas all these other phases exist within that matrix. So we're creating mine, mine waste that has high value in our new transition to the new economy. Um, but we also see deposits that may not be economic for that primary commodity, but which do have a significant endowment of the secondary phase, which up until now has been viewed as non-traditional. And I think that governments around the globe at a federal, state, uh, all sorts of levels, need to be conscious that um, a lot of those smaller scale deposits may need assistance in terms of uh, building infrastructure, um, creating creating common user um, facilities for processing, for example. And that is something that we're looking at very closely in Queensland, um, how, to, how to bring those hubs of processing to make it more efficient and then to generate more um, downstream processes and manufacturing on a local scale, uh, which then in the global picture reduces the, the um, carbon footprint of anything in the supply chain down the track so that um, we're not shipping, you know, tonnes and tonnes and tonnes of, of raw material. We're shipping a much smaller amount of something that has been more manufactured, I suppose. And we don't treat our countries like a quarry and send them off overseas. Um, and then I think, Daniel, you asked about the um, changes in investment that we see um, and the growing dominance of ESG factors, so um, environment, society and governance. Uh, frameworks, look, companies, companies at all stages or, or all, um, all parts of the supply chain are really being driven by this ESG trend and we see um, we see dramatic shifts in investment patterns. Uh, BlackRock, for example, the really large investment house have a few years ago said that they were no longer investing in coal or coal projects. Um, and then people, you know, you see the mums and dads or the other investment uh, bodies shifting with those big, those big companies, um, places like Europe, have signed the European Green Deal, which means that there are now rules around the ESG credentials of raw materials that come into the region for use in their domestic industry. Uh, so that investment trend is then being followed up by a government um, government action and, and regulatory control. So consumers want to know more about the products that they're consuming the energy that they're using in their homes, the car that they're driving, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, they want to know not just immediately where it's come from, but where it's come from along every step of that supply chain, from taking it out of the ground to using it in their home. Um, and look, would those, would mining companies, for example, make those changes to how they operate to the level of transparency that we're now seeing for a lot of companies? Would they make those changes if there wasn't the pressure from shareholders? I don't know, probably not. Um, but money talks and investors at all scales are talking with their money. So we do see these big changes, which then not only drive um, how companies operate and how companies change, but how governments, local governments, uh, federal level governments, how they change in terms of policy and regulation as well, which, which is um, growing, growing all the time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Degling. Uh, that was uh, that was fantastic. Um, there's a huge array of things that 
obviously a, a state government can do to to sort of drive this area and, and Queensland's been one of those places that you've really been at the, the front of the agenda um, despite the fact that you know 1968 was when we should have read that paper um, and really got on the move uh, but there, there is obviously um, uh, you know, a momentum now um, happening in this space. I'm seeing lots of questions coming in on the Q&A function. Rick is doing his best to answer some of them. Um, I'll just summarise some of the answers that he's already given uh, before we uh, move to our final panellist, uh, Gustavo. Um, so there was a question around efficiency in some of the graphs um, and uh, whether that efficiency in mining has been increasing. Um, Rick's answer was that uh, yes, the industry has been devoting a lot of investment to efficiency improvements, and we have got efficiency improvements over time. It's just that those are, you know, reaching their um, the end of their ability to sort of um, 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 move forward. Um, then uh, there's the question around technological advances and cost reduction. Is it possible to accept ex expect that? the profits that will be incrementally made can be better shared with producing countries. And uh, Rick's answer to that was that um, the lack of benefit to communities in host countries is a key factor preventing achievement of the future mineral supply. So it's one way of opening um, up that possibility of mineral suppliers to have a better um, balanced, more balanced relationship uh, with host countries in terms of uh, um, um, the, the benefits of uh, financial benefits of extraction. There was another question um, around reducing the impact uh, or what is the potential for recycling and would greater um, ability to recycle um, meet some of the demand that we have for this increase in new commodities? And I think Rick's answer was that yes, recycling is predicted to grow and is growing, but the challenge will be that the increased demand will far outstrip that recycling because of population growth, because of the um, increased economic activity, uh, et cetera. Um, so th uh, they're, the answer, they're the questions that have been answered. I think there's more that are still to be answered that, um, that you as the audience will see as we go along. Um, some of those questions are around, is there competition between uh, producing countries and um, will geopolitics play a role like it has in oil? Uh, there was another question around, um, could we better exchange ESG practices across Brazil and Australia. I hope we're trying to do that now. Um, definitely, we can do that more in the future. Uh, there was a question asking whether research partnerships could help that Brazil-Australia exchange um, and the potential for an SMI ICE Brazil. Um, that's referring to the SMI International Centre of Excellence in Chile. Could we do something similar in Brazil? It's an interesting question. Um, we'll leave that open to, to people that, um, that have a greater power with these things than, than myself to answer. Um, lots of questions also around whether taxation systems could be changed to, to resolve some of these challenges or whether we are indeed seeing the environmental um, changes that are needed in the, in the regulatory system to keep up with these challenges. Um, and um, there were some questions asking whether um, more could be done in that in that space. So I'll I'll let some of our um, panelists um, answer some of those questions. Hopefully we can get to them answered in in the um, in the text in the chat part of this. Uh, so if you're a panelist, please feel free to answer some of those while we're listening now to uh, Gustavo. So I'll hand over now to Gustavo Bastos uh, from Vali, um, who is going to talk to us about the experience of being a major miner and um, and kind of innovating with this challenge. Um, he's from the Center of Excellence in Technology and Innovation for Iron Ore. So Gustavo, I'm interested in th this Center of Excellence. Could you tell me a bit about what it does and how it's addressing the challenges that we've talked about uh, today, um, particularly energy efficiency. We've not talked as much about energy efficiency today, but there's a lot that can be sort of um, won there in terms of processing, transportation, et cetera. Can you tell us about the the Valley experience. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for the, the question. Good morning, good evening to everybody. Uh, on behalf of Valley, it's an honor to be here, very pleased. We were talking a little bit on uh, collaboration. I believe this is already a strong symbol, right? Academy, government, industry from Australia and Brazil discussing together. 
uh, I'll just uh, share some uh, thoughts here, then I'll, I'll try to cover your, you know, your point, just uh, uh, on our path, right? So as Rick and Alan have already shared, uh, this is a collective goal, right? We're not talking only about uh, reducing emissions as Rick presented in his material. We have already committed uh, to reducing scopes one and two by 33%. Also, energy from renewable sources by 2025 in Brazil and 2030 globally. But they come together with other aspects, right? Forest protection and restoration, uh, social economic aspects, as Ellen uh, mentioned as well, and also the ESG gaps. So we do believe that it's not only the emissions uh, alone, but how, then, how can we treat them together with other aspects of sustainability goals, let's say. And that's why we, we're addressing many of them, not only emissions. Uh, as per uh, efficiency or energy efficiency, you know, what we are uh, understanding is that this is uh, mandatory. Uh, we have projects and initiatives that uh, uh, touch on that uh, point in different uh, phases of the production chain, right? Be it a uh, metallurgical process, uh, mining underground and open pit and railway. Uh, but uh, our knowledge, uh, Daniel and, and colleagues, is that they will be not enough. And that's why we have uh, structured the power shift program. So uh, besides what we're doing on uh, incremental improvements, let's say, on en energy efficiency, we do believe that technology shift will, will play a strong role. And that's why within Center of Excellence, we have uh, structured the power shift program. Uh, to incorporate those technology changes in the different uh, phases of the production chain, as I mentioned. So open pit, railway, uh, underground mining, and also metallurgical processes, be it pelletizing plants or, or base metals plants. We have had some uh, uh, interesting improvements and examples. So receiving the first uh, electric lo locomotive last year, this year we're going to receive a second one also improving on the uh, underground uh, equipment, uh, electric based, battery electric vehicles, and also other initiatives. And uh, the main challenges there uh, are associated with the speed in which we're going to be able to deploy them, uh, costs associated as well, uh, the supply of them. And that's why I believe, and we believe at Valley that the collaboration is going to be uh, key to that. One example then, and one of the questions uh, uh, the audience asked about collaboration. We have a recent example with the industry in Australia. It's a, an open innovation challenge called Charge On uh, between Rio, BHP, Valley, and now we have other companies uh, joining, uh, associated to uh, develop processes for charging better electric trucks. So this is a problem that the industry will face, right? Not only Valley or not only the Australian companies. So why not do this in a collaborative way so this is one real uh, recent example that uh, it's possible to do this uh, that way. So uh, in a nutshell, you know, I believe uh, there is a space and we are focusing on that. We are one of the biggest consumers in, in our country. Uh, so all those short-term initiatives are necessary and valid, but we do believe we also need some shifts in processes and also technology. And we're willing to do so. As Rick mentioned, we have declared not only scopes one and two goals, but also scope three. But we do believe this is a, a global and an industry challenge. And that's why we're willing to collaborate and cooperate with uh, Australia, other players. Uh, we believe this is the only way we're going to reach the targets in the time that we're declaring, right? And that's the approach we have been using. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Um, I mean, Vali is also innovating in the tailings space as well with um, new projects around uh, recycling of tailings material into construction material. And that's something uh, we're working on here um, at the Sustainable Minerals Institute with the University of Geneva and, and Vali at the moment. So there's that's lots of kind of innovations that are happening with this, you know, these new um, sustainability energy transition demands uh, across the sector. We're seeing uh, in the Q&A box, uh, lots and lots of questions still coming in. And um, I can see that um, <laughs> our panelists have answered seven so far. There's uh, still many more to go. Um, what I might do now, um, we've got about five minutes remaining uh, in, in the slot. We've 
Um, we've had you for an hour and a half, so thank you for committing that time so far as an audience. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, audience members still on board, so it's great that we've taken you all this way near to the end. Uh, and we're receiving some uh, good encouragement in the chat box uh, about the, the conversation so far. A lot of people in the Q&A are super interested in the idea of two huge producer nations like Australia and Brazil dialoguing, learning from each other, doing collaborative work together. Um, and so there's quite a, um, a few of the questions that relate to that. Um, I wonder if I can quickly open it to the floor, maybe for some quick final remarks from, from each of the panelists. I might start with Rick actually, because we haven't heard from you for a little while, but um, I wonder if there's something in this Brazil-Australia dialogue potential, because of the experience that the two countries have, um, and how do we take that further in terms of this specific area of energy and climate? Um, so that, that's kind of a broad question, or if there's anything else in the Q&A that you think that you'd like to, to, uh, to respond to on the floor. And maybe I'll then ask each of our panelists to, to quickly make some, you know, one or two minutes of final remarks before we, we close our session. Thanks, Daniel. I'll, I'll keep mine um, really brief. I've been trying to answer as many questions as I can, and there have been a lot of uh, very good um, and interesting questions. I think the answer I've given to, to quite a few people is around the need to change the equation entirely. I think that that's, uh, you know, quite a few people have been asking about how do we do this better? How do we, how, how do we bring communities along that will allow us to gain access to these minerals and, and changing the value equation for stakeholders and communities in the area of mines is a, is a fundamental change. We've done all the fundamental changes in, in, um, um, technological innovation that we need and we have the infrastructure set up to continue to do those. Um, so that's that's one point. And then the other point I'm just going to pass straight over to Helen and that is that I, I, Helen is intimately involved in a collaborative effort between a number of different countries on, um, on critical metals and could maybe comment on potential roles for, for Brazil in the future in that area. But, but we share so much geology and 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 um, um, endowment that uh, it would make a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you, Rico. Um, Helen, to the, um, the the collaborative partnership around critical metals. Please tell us more. Um, so within Queensland, and I've just sort of typed typed this answer into one of the questions asking about partnerships on how we approach um, an ESG framework between Brazil and. And Australia, I've just put that in the in the Q and A answers, so I'll I'll answer it, I guess, live as well. Um, resources sector is is a global industry, and the supply chains are global. And and as uh, one of the one of the audience members has pointed out, both Brazil and Australia have tended to um, treat their resources as a raw material to be exported rather than developing further down the supply chain. Um, I think because it's a global, climate change is a global problem. Um, the resources industry is a global industry. We also need to then treat um, ESG credentials, for example, as a global, in a global way. Um, in Europe, I think that they're a little more advanced than, than say, um, Australia, South America and other other jurisdictions in that um, there's active development of things like a battery passport where there's traceability of, um, of all of the components of things that, things that go into another thing, you know, all the raw materials that then create a battery or a car or a wind turbine or a solar panel or a et cetera, dot, 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 all the, all the things that we use in society. Um, Within Australia, uh, the Critical Minerals Facilitation Office is working on a, an ethical certification scheme, working with the Future Batteries Industries CRC. So there's there's movement within Australia on you know at a state level and a federal level on on how we achieve that, um, and that it, trying to define that traceability 
through through the entire supply chain. You know, blockchain has been proposed as a as a way to do that as well. So there's a lot of different approaches, um, but I I agree that it needs to be done on a global scale. Brazil and Australia could work really closely together on this sort of thing. Um, Within the Geological Survey of Queensland, myself and the Chief Government Geologist, Tony Knight, are actively engaging with international markets and international organisations to develop those partnerships. At the moment, we're working closely with um, different European organisations, um, but we do aim to uh, focus on, on other markets, you know, the, the South American um, countries as well, uh, North America, and then of course Asia. So it's a it's a progressive thing. It's made more possible these days through um, through the online format. So we don't have to physically travel quite so much. But it's an important thing to do, and we need to collaborate. and And our collaboration with the with Rick and the team at at SMI is a really big part of that as well because a lot of a lot of the work that we've been able to achieve is in partnership with them um, and using using the contacts that SMI has in South America and Brazil specifically is uh, is really important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deckling. Um, certainly the SMI has um, over the years had quite a, a deep relationship with our partners in Brazil and different universities, Minas Gerais, Sao Paulo, um, Rio. Um, and uh, it's it's kind of something that we have uh, nurtured over time because we have so many alumni as well that uh, have come to study here or um, uh, colleagues that have studied over there. So it'd be great to see that build and grow. Um, Frederico, could I ask you for some uh, very quick final words um, uh, on today's um, uh, discussion? Anything in the in the chat box that you wanted to to address? Claro. Claro. É, bom, eu acho que a parceria do, do Instituto de Mineração ele está se ampliando, agora sai desses polos que o Daniel comentou, mas chega a Brasília também, é, no sentido de nós estreitarmos ainda mais essa, essa, essa parceria entre, entre Brasil e Austrália. E eu achei muito interessante uma, uma pergunta que foi colocada sobre a questão da geopolítica é, desse tema. Realmente é um tema disruptivo, que eu acho que assim deve ser. né? Nesse cenário, eu, eu gostaria até de, de colocar alguns pontos, eu acho que a própria característica desses elementos é, de serem depósitos menores, de serem mais diversificados, né? e, e empresas, e não excluindo o cobre, mas empresas menores, eu acho que pode dar um, 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 outro, um outro olhar para a geopolítica desses elementos, né? que esses elementos vão provocar, é bem diferente do que a gente viu no petróleo, mas, de certa forma, é um, é um desafio muito grande. É, bom, enfim, eu gostaria de, de agradecer muito a, a oportunidade, eu acho que é um, foi, foi um ótimo evento, né, que remonta toda a discussão ISD que nós nós temos que fazer. Eu acho que o nosso próximo seminário, ele traz exatamente isso, que é a questão da discussão é do uso de rejeitos na mineração, então a gente vai utilizar muito dessas informações que nós discutimos hoje, nosso próximo seminário. Então, eu só gostaria de agradecer e dizer que o Ministério de Energia está à disposição. Caso alguma resposta não tenha é, sido respondida, eu vou colocar aqui o um, um nosso e-mail no chat para que, que a gente possa responder a todos. Thank you, Frederico. Gustavo, yeah, final words. Uh, sharing from the practical perspective of a, a large industry player and dealing with an, these challenges and opportunities. Okay, Daniel, thank you once more for the opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, global challenge, it will require collaboration and uh, coordination between different players, uh, academy, governments. Uh, we do believe this is the way it is possible. It's already starting to happen. For all the numbers we have seen, we we'll have to move faster. And uh, I do believe that there is a space for mutual collaboration between uh, big players in the industry and the industry uh, as a whole. So I appreciate the opportunity once more. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We've now reached the close of the webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Before we end, 
I'd like to express my sincere thanks to uh, Secretary uh, Vigigal, Ambassador Kane, and Professor Plint for their support. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Professor Valenta, Dr. Degling, uh, Frederico Gustavo for their participation on the panel. If you've got any feedback or questions, um, I know that the SMI communications team have posted their email address in the chat function. So please do write to us uh, and ask us. Um, we very much look forward to welcoming you all to the next two webinars, which will be held at the end of this month and in early July. Uh, invitations will be sent out in the coming week. Um, so you should all receive that. Thanks very much for your attention. Um, have a very good rest of the day or evening, depending on which uh, part of the world you're in. Thank you.